I'm Heather Marie Montilla, and you are watching PBS Books. Last summer, we began our celebration of the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment and pioneering women. This summer, PBS has been highlighting Latinos through a variety of programming on TV. So it seems almost fitting to highlight a tremendous trailblazer in her field, author Meg Medina. Before we begin, I'd like to thank our library part engagement partners across the country, as well as numerous PBS stations for joining us. But most importantly, we would like to thank viewers like you. A quick reminder, if you have a question, please enter it in the chat. We'll ask Meg viewer questions at the end of the conversation. Today's conversation celebrates Great's trailblazer Meg Medina, exploring her latest book released in 2021, Mercy Suarez, Can't Dance. In many ways, Meg Medina does not need an introduction. She has written picture books, middle grade books, and YA fiction for nearly two decades. In 2016, she won the Pura Bel Pre Honor Award for Abuela and Me, and in 2019, her middle grade book, Mercy Suarez, Changing Gears, won her the Newbery Medal. She is the daughter of Cuban immigrants, grew up in Queens, New York, now lives in Richmond, Virginia. Welcome, Meg. We are so very excited to have you here today. Oh, hola, Heather. I'm thrilled to be here, too, and welcome to my writing space. Well, we are so glad to have you and to hear a little bit more about your book that was released in 2021. Your first book, Mercy Suarez, um, Changing Gears, was, as we said, a Newbery Award winning book. But I know, or at least I believe, that Mercy first debuted in Soul Painting as part of a middle grade anthology, Flying Lessons and Other Stories. Did you, when you included her, hope to write a series? And did you know it would have a middle school aged heroine? Oh, no, I had no idea. <laughs> when I wrote the story, I had, I had just been asked to submit a story to an anthology that ended up being really successful, um, Flying Lessons and Other Stories. And in it, it was sold painting. The only requirement of the story was to have a heroine um, from a marginalized background. And obviously I, I was going to write a Latina girl. And it was then that I started to give voice to this really plucky girl named Mercedes, Mercy, um, whose dad owns a painting company. And in that story, they spend the day um, painting the school gym in exchange for a tuition break at her new Tony school. And it's a snapshot the way that stories are about um, culture, about economics, about that moment when kids um, become aware maybe of the sacrifices that their parents are making for them, even if they don't really understand them. So I finished that story and I just could not stop thinking about Mercy. And both the editor, Phoebe Ye, the editor at, um, who edited the anthology, and my editor at Candlewick said, you know, the problem is that Medici is a character who's too big for just a story. <laughs> Think about it, is, you know, is there more to tell? And so I was thinking, you know, she was in the sixth grade. And I, I don't know, Heather, think back to when you were in the sixth grade, the seventh grade, and the eighth grade. It's like a metamorphosis, right? <laughs> it's a, it, there's, you emerge this completely different person than, than how you began. And so I thought I'd really like to write that first part, the first story. And so I wrote Merci Suarez Changes Gears. And when I finished, I realized that I wanted to continue with the metamorphosis. So that's how Merci Suarez Can't Dance happened, which is Merci in the seventh grade. And I just turned in the manuscript. It went into copy editing yesterday um, for the last book, which um, comes out next year. And it's called Merci Suarez Plays It Cool. And that will be the last year. And we'll see Merci in all forms. Um, what happened to her in middle school? Most people shudder at the thought of their middle school years. I don't, I don't know was, if it was that way for you, but it was for sure that way for me. 
It totally was that way for me. I think that it's, you know, everyone spoke with an author who said that the middle school years are called the ugly years. Um, and it's really amazing how hard it is to go through middle school. You know, one of one of the things I, I we are here to discuss Mercy Suarez can't dance. And what I would love is for you to share a little bit about the story, the premise of the story, um, and, and what happens without yes. spoiling. Anything. <laughs> no spoilers allowed. No spoilers allowed. Okay, so in this book, so when we left Medici at the end of uh, Medici Suarez Changes Gears, it was the end of sixth grade. Um, she had come to realize that her grandfather Lolo is is suffering with with Alzheimer's and what that would likely mean um, in for her, and she had tangled with. The most annoying young woman in her same grade, Edna Santos, right? And had come out on the other side of it somehow. So in the seventh grade, Mercy is roped into being the co manager of the school store, the Ram Depot, which formerly just sold pencils to forgetful children. But because she is a business dynamo, Miss <laughs> McDaniels, our friendly school secretary, um, gets her to be co-manager with a young man named Wilson Bellevue, which means that she is going to be sharing very small space all year with a boy in the seventh grade. So this is a little awkward for her. She's not sure what she thinks about this. So I would say that um, this novel is about Medici figuring out relationships. She ends up in a big problem with her friends, big, big fallout there. She ends up watching her aunt sort of fall in love, the Inez. She's thinking about feelings with, with Wilson herself. It's, it's about all kinds of love, like love with your friends, love that you see between your grandparents, the icky kind of love you see when your parents are holding hands, ah, the secret love, right? Like, like um, you remember your first crush? Right. Sometimes they're on make believe people, you know, on, on posters, on people in the movies and so on. Uh, all of that, all of that soup is there. What happens to her in the seventh grade? And of course, the through line is also that Lolo continues to get um, more impacted by Alzheimer's and Mercy has to adapt to that change. That's, you know, that's what's happening. Would you like to hear a piece of it? I would love to hear a piece of it. Yes, please. Okay. <laughs> okay. So here's just so that you guys can hear what it sounds like, Medici in the seventh grade. So here's the setup. They're at the lockers. You know, everything good and bad happens at the lockers, right? That's true. So um, she gets to her locker after school, and Medici believes that after school, she and her friend Hannah and Lena are going to go to her house to ride scooters and, and so on. But Edna has other ideas. Edna is in charge of the heart ball, meaning the Valentine's Day dance, and she has scheduled a must-attend meeting of this um, dance committee, Hannah being a member. So I'm going to just read you a little exchange between Hannah and Lena and um, Medici. And then what happens when her mother just sort of happens into this problem? So here we go. Edna has just stormed off saying, which means hurry up in French. She's taking French this year. <laughs> so Hannah digs through her locker as Edna marches off. What is she even saying through those puckered lips? All I hear is zhu, zhu, zhu. Lena giggles. Why don't you skip today? I whisper to Hannah. The evil dance queen will live. Merci. I made a commitment. Plus, she's not that bad, Hannah says. I brush her words aside. But you were going to take the twins to the park and do tricks on Lena's scooter, remember? She pauses, looking from me to Lena. Lena smiles. A day off isn't so bad, she says. Hannah looks doubtful, and for a second, I think we freed her from Edna's clutches. But no, Hannah would rather eat dirt than let someone down or break any rules. She starts down the hall. I wish I could, Mercy, but I'm on the committee, and I have a ton of paper flowers to make. She walks backward a few paces. Wait, 
we'll hang out soon. Tell Axel and Tomas I said hi. Before I can argue, she turns and dashes down the hall after Edna, who's already sprinting around the corner on those gangly legs she's gotten this year. Lena peers through the exit and that leads to the car loop. Your mom's here. She holds open the door for me and lets in the chilly gust. I hitch up my backpack and follow, but my mood has fouled. How was school? Mom asks as we buckle in. It's the same question she asks every day, but right now I don't want to answer it. What part does she mean? School was a gazillion ways. It was boring in English because we worked on grammar and awful in science thanks to my dumb test. It was fun in PE because I hit all my layups and it's horrible right this second because one of my best friends in the whole world won't come over. Who has time for a conversation about all of that? Mommy holds her eyes on me in the rearview mirror. The car engine is still humming in park. My ride is being held hostage until I communicate like a proper unstressed child. Good, I mutter. I look out the window as we pull out. It's not a big deal, I try to tell myself. Hannah's just volunteering after school. But there's a little voice way inside my head and it won't stop taunting me. Hannah picked Edna instead of you. And that's where I'll stop. It's I, will, <laughs> I will say the ability for you to capture the complexity of the character as well as these stories, these conflicts, the, they seem so real. And my question for you is, how do you do it? Do you, do you draw directly on your experience or indirectly um, of whether it is when you were a kid or when you were raising kids, or do you just go hang out with middle schoolers? <laughs> like, how do you do it? Well, that would be weird, right? <laughs> Who is that grown lady hanging out with us? Um, no, so here's the thing. I think for, and I say this to writers all the time when I'm when I'm teaching writing at Hamlin or, or in workshops or whatever. So you have to be able as a children's book writer to stay connected with who you were as a child at different ages. And for that, I think you have to spend a lot of time in your memory. So um, I often will spend like one once, I don't know, I want to say once a day, but that's probably not true. But a, a few times a week, at least, I spend time just remembering something of my childhood. I'll write, I remember, and I'll pick something random. Sometimes it's my roller skates or my favorite shirt or the taste of how I, how I used to blow three bubbles in a row inside bazooka bubble gum. You know, whatever it is, I pick a, a, an age and I try to re-inhabit it. And I think that what happens is in the beginning, you're just sort of recalling the details that are fuzzy but somewhere around like the sixth or seventh minute, the trap door drops and you start to realize why you remember that particular thing, why it clawed in your memory. It's usually attached to something that was really meaningful, a person, an event, a feeling. Um, and so I just, I try to stay connected with that a lot. I also, um, I just observe people and kids. Um, and, and really try to see them honestly, even the kid who's a pill, you know, even Edna, as I draw her, as you'll see in, in this novel, like she is a piece of work, that girl, but she has layers too. Um, we're not all born difficult or easy or anything like that. You're at some total of your experiences. And so I try to unpack some of that and try to give kids a sense that people aren't just a flat version. They aren't just flatly good or flatly bad. There's, there's depth to them. And there's also opportunity for growth inside of them. If there's ever a time that, that kids need to know that, that you can be awful and come out of it, that you can make a mistake and fix it, that you can make a different decision for yourself. If there's ever a time that kids need to know that, it's during middle school because they're in such a, a 
process of thinking about themselves and reinventing themselves and making tons and tons and tons of mistakes. Um, and we can't ask for more than that from them. This is where they are. And so the, the question is like, it, how do we help them not see that as an end point, right? It's just an experience that you learn from and you, you keep going into your next more improved self and on and on and on. You know, your words are so insightful because I do think middle schoolers, it's it's okay to make mistakes, right? It's okay to learn and to to have those. Um, I mean, friendships are complex in middle school. I still remember, I, you know, exactly the, the dynamics and the, the drama. Um, when you're crafting characters and you're also, I mean, you have the friends and you have the family, right? How are you thinking about you know, is there something motivating you behind like, oh, I really want to prove this point or does the story, I guess I'm talking a little bit about your creative process, but I wanted to get into it more later, is how you think about it. Is the story in your head and you just have to get it down on paper or as you're writing, does the story take you? Yeah, I, it's the second one. I, I never have anything at the beginning other than the girl. It's usually a girl in my, my work the main character and the outward problem, the most visible problem that the character is willing to share with me at this moment. So in Merci Suarez, right, the problem is, oh, I have to run the school store and they're gonna ask me to be a photographer at the school dance. Like those are the two problems. But as you can see, right, those are, those are the superficial problems. Those are the problems at first glance, but that's never the whole problem, right? when you drill down is when you really, and, and see the character in action is when their feelings are revealed, when, you know, their self doubts are revealed, their, their darker impulses, like all of that gets unpacked as the story goes on. So when I send, and I, I'm not doing any spoilers, but when I send Medici to that dance, I had no idea what was going to happen at that dance. <laughs> Just let that sit with you for a while. I was as surprised as the next person. So sometimes I'm writing it like this, like, oh no, don't do it. You know, like, like that. It's like, stop yourself, mercy. What are you doing? Come to your senses, girl. But, um, you know, I have to let her make a mess of it all, right? And then figure out how to fix the mess because that's part of growing up, right? Part of, part of growing up is learning how to acknowledge that when you've made the mess and when you have to fix the mess. Um, and that's not how we start out when we're little, little, right? It's somebody else's fault or somebody helps us pick it up or whatever. But as you get older, you find out, right? It, it, it has to be you. And so, yeah, I mean, it's a fun way to write, but I will say this as a writer, it's a very inefficient way to write. <laughs> like I, I have jealousy for the people who, who will say, and the, maybe some of them are out here to, saying things like, um, you know, I plot my novel, I know exactly what's gonna happen. I, I deviate a little bit from the outline, but I basically know where it's at. That's never me. That is <laughs> never, never me. I sort of have an idea and I don't, even have a sense of the ending until I'm almost at the disaster point in the middle of the novel. You know, like how everything is getting terrible and it's like the worst possible thing is happening. Then is when I start sitting back going, oh man, so now really how is she gonna get out of it? Like what does, what do I think I wanna see happen? So on the back end is when I, I start to sort of advanced plot a little bit more, but never on the upswing. In terms of family, right? I think she has an older brother who is super smart um, okay. and people compare. I went through that, you know, everyone was like, oh, she's smart, her brother's smart. Um, have you, is that something you experienced in your life? Expectations put on you in, in schools, especially middle school, because it's three grades, right? So people know one another. Um, yeah. how, how did that, how, how did you formulate that? Yeah, I did. I didn't have that exactly um, because my my biological sister is five years older than I am, and so I, you know, she we were in completely different 
you know, school spaces. But I will say this, my sister it was a very, very talented uh, visual artist and very intellectual. And as a child, I was neither one of those things. I was a very busy person. I was running around, I was talking, I was in it. I, I know you can't imagine, but I was, I was that kid. I was very hard to keep still. Um, curious, a good reader, a good student, but you know, a handful. And um, I never felt as smart as, as uh, my sister was. Um, but I, when I drew Rolly, you know, I, there were very few men in my life. I didn't, my dad was gone, my, my uncle passed away, my grandparents. So I was mostly raised by Thea's, by my aunts and my grandmother and my mother. And, and then there was my sister. So we were all women. So sometimes, you know, my, my writing often celebrates girls and strong girls and strong women. And in my young adult novels, my teen novels, I, I, some of the response has been, oh, you're, you know, you're pretty hard sometimes on the, on the men in your novels, right? They're, they're, they don't come out smelling like roses. And so when I was drawing Medici's family, I wanted to really draw um, good men for her. You know, I married a very good man. Javier, my husband, um, uh, is a, a wonderful dad, a wonderful Latino father. And I, I said, you know, I want her to have a papi like that, right? And then I imagined, like, what would be the greatest brother? He would be a pain because he's so, you know, perfect in so many ways. But I gave him some funny flaws, you know, his driving ability, being chief among them. He's a terrible driver. Um, and I just wanted to explore the relationship between siblings, because I think regardless of whether it's brother and brother or brother and sister, I think siblings can sometimes share things and solve things between themselves that, that they don't, you know, share with their parents. It's a whole other relationship that I wanted to see, that I wanted to examine. You are 100% correct. And I, I don't know how many siblings you had, but I had two. Um, and we were always scheming and solving and, and trying to make things work. So two probably my, yeah. my parents' chagrin <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Well, but it makes sense, right? It, it, it makes sense. It just, um, they're closer to you in age. They, they don't feel so remote like your parents do. They love you and know you and despise you like all at the same time in, in a really particular way. Yeah. And so I, I don't know. I think there's, there's a lot to explore there. I mean, I, in other books, I've explored really difficult sibling relationships, you know, siblings that cannot be together, who really have problems together. But um, in this series, I wanted the opposite. I wanted a really healthy Latino family. And, and that was the other thing, you know, I felt like I was writing you know, when you're writing Latino families, like it, I, I didn't want to write a narrative of, of, of suffering and of brokenness and so on. There are many stories, unfortunately, that are true in our communities, right? Of, of, you know, a lot of suffering, a lot of difficulty. Um, but I, I, that's not the whole story. So it's important, I think, for Latino children and all children to experience Latino families in the whole range. Like there's all kinds of, of stories and people that fall under this massive umbrella that we call Latino. Um, so it felt important to me to, to draw this family as well. You release your books in English and Spanish, and I know that that is not, you know, sometimes that's very hard for some authors to, to do both even at once. Sometimes they stagger them. Um, and I know what's also very special is that you're writing, as we've been discussing about the, the Latino, Latina experience. And could you talk a little bit about writing in, in dual languages and also even, yes, why don't we start there? And one of the things I will note is one of your recent books, right? Evelyn Del Rey is moving away, which even from just, you know, it, it is one of those catchy books. Um, my family recently moved too, so it resonated as we read it. Um, we actually had received the Spanish book, so we were reading it in our house um, over the last few weeks. And it's just such a beautiful book about friendship. Um, and if you could talk though about, you know, a, 
about that process and even how you came up with the idea too, because I, um, but maybe we'll start with, I know that was a long question with. <laughs> <laughs> I'm keeping track. I'm keeping track of it. Okay. So first let's talk about language. Okay. So the first thing is that I write in English um, because I'm, I, I am bilingual. I can write in Spanish, I can read in Spanish, but I don't read and write in Spanish as well as I do in English. And so I choose to write in English. I use what we call translanguaging a lot, meaning you know how this is, Heather, in your family, I'm sure. We start a sentence in English, in the middle it goes to Spanish, it ends in English again, right? Mm -hmm. And um, we use phrases, we borrow phrases in and out from both languages as we communicate. And that felt important to me to give to Mercy's family, that they speak this way because this is the way that Latino families communicate. There, it, within a single family, you can have folks who only are monolingual Spanish, who are monolingual English, who uh, who speak a little bit of both, who understand but don't speak, who speak, you know, like there's this whole mishmash. And so we find a way. If you wanted a good example is like you could see like at the Latin Grammys when when the artists come to get their awards, some of them don't speak Spanish, right? And so the interviewer from Telemundo or wherever, right, they're, they're, they adapt. They ask some of the questions in English. They translate. It's, it's a really fluid thing. Latino identity is not about speaking Spanish, right? It's a, it's a wider, it's a wider net. So I'm very fortunate that my translators have been Cuban people because of course, um, Spanish from different countries has all different idioms and different sounds and different twists and of phrases. So um, my translators have been Teresa, the late Teresa Malauer, um, who translated Evelyn del Rey Se Muda and, and my previous novel. But for the Mercy series, the wonderful translator Alexis Romay uh, is, is a Cuban man who lives in New Jersey and uh, he has translated both novels. And watching him work and having them capture, knowing exactly the Cuban phrase that I was after and the flavor, the, the vocabulary, the, the cadence of how we speak fan Spanish. Oye muchacho, estás loco. You know, like those kinds of things, like the Cuban way that we talk, that they get dead on. And um, Teresa, was the uh, translator for Evelyn del Rey Se Muda. And it was her last translation, I think before she passed away, unfortunately um, from cancer last year. And she called me shortly, we were on the phone. Uh, she had finished working on it. And she had said to me that she couldn't translate the Mercy book because it was just too too much for her at that point, but that she was really glad that she had done the, um, Evelyn del Rey Se Muda, because it had reminded her of her friend that she had left behind in Cuba. Mm -hmm. When Teresa had left, she, her friend, her friends, she and her friend had a rift, as many people did around politics at that time. And then she hadn't seen her friend for many years. And then many years later, they got in touch through her friend's mother and she went to visit Cuba with her husband and she got to reunite with this friend. And ultimately it was that friend who when Teresa was ailing in her very final month, came to be with her wow. and to help her at, at, at her at her end. And so uh, that was just, that was a, a beautiful completion of a circle because um, I think that friends, especially folks who've had to leave their countries, who are immigrants, like, do find uh, I, like a, a place in this story also. There's a, there's a loss, there's a, a loss of people who matter to us and then a celebration of how we can hold on to them. So that's one of my favorite memories and about Evelyn del Rey and about Teresa. And I feel so happy that she introduced me to Alexis Rome and that he is the translator and with all the bells and whistles to him. I think it's its its own art form and um, 
every time I get something that he's translated, I'm just delighted. <laughs> well, that's yeah. wonderful and a really touching story. Um, we're going to take a moment and just remind you, you are watching PBS Books. I'm Heather Marie Montilla, and I'm here with trailblazing author Meg Medina. If you have a question, put it in the chat. Don't forget, we're discussing Meg Medina's work and how she has shared her experiences and perspectives through her work. This summer, PBS is presenting The Latino Experience, which is both nonfiction and fiction short films. They explore a broad range of collections of experiences, perspectives, and point of views to highlight the diversity of Latino, Latina, and Latinx communities, and to illuminate the vibrancy of the Latina community in the United States and Puerto Rico. Let's watch a trailer. PBS is proud to present The Latino Experience, a special collection of short films from a visionary group of filmmakers, from intimate family dramas. That's a promise. To thought-provoking documentaries. Witness the stories, the struggles, the celebrations. 13 short films that highlight the rich and diverse world of The Latino Experience. Only on PBS. The Latino Experience can be streamed at pbs.org and amplifies important voices and stories. Well, just a reminder, here with Meg Medina. Meg, a decade ago, as my children began to read, I looked for children's books, and in children's books at the time, I found very few Latino children and families represented in children's literature. I was hoping you could share a little bit about is that what you saw too? And how that maybe shaped your writing? Yeah, I really did see that. And I have to say, even, even growing up, I was a, I was a reader as a, as a child. I don't think that the lack of representation exactly stopped me from reading. But later in my life, when I got to college and I started reading the, the masters, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, and you know, all the, all the grand, poets, um, all the Latin American writers, the Spanish writers, et cetera. I, I was, um, I, I guess the best thing I could say is that I was almost angry. I was almost outraged that it had been kept from me. There's literature that, that would have really helped me understand, um, understand myself better. And it really wasn't until Sandra Cisneros' um, book came out that that I felt like the the house on Mango Street, and a lot of us will point to that book similarly to how people will point to the bluest eye and so on. But the house on Mango Street suddenly there were girls with you know patent leather shoes and no socks and eating rice and beans and jumping on the sofa, and it was like, oh, I know them. There, these are my friends. This is this is my family. Te conozco, and it felt like, um, like, like I I was suddenly seen. So that was my experience, you know. As then, as a young adult, it was many years later, right? I I had children. I was I I had taught, and and then I was finally turning to um, writing for children, and I felt an urgency about having my own kids feel connected to their identity. We live in, in Richmond, Virginia, which does not have a big Latino population. And I, when we first were moving here, I was really concerned about that because I had never lived in a place with so few. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we were gonna be far from family. There were no, you know, there was no restaurants. There was no media in, in Spanish. There was nothing, right? And And as it happened, they were, the only Latino kids in their elementary school. And that was very strange. Um, so when I started writing, it felt important to me to break that cycle, to, to do what I thought Sandra Cisneros had done, which is to say, what I know, what I have lived, the people I have seen and experienced with these eyes and this heart and so on, that's enough. That can make a good book and good literature. 
And so I really started very close to the bone. I mean, I was thinking of the stories my grandmother, Bena, um, told me. I, I thought of the women in the factory that worked alongside my mother. I thought of my neighbors growing up in Queens. I, I just pulled from life and started to create novels that, that spoke to the experience that I felt was true. Um, and so one of the most rewarding things is when I go to schools and I see sometimes, you know, it's it's not as, as severe as it was certainly when I was growing up, but it's exciting to see kids see in me a, a possibility for themselves. Like they can be authors, they could be illustrators, they, um, their families, their stories, the things they find funny, their experiences, they can put in, in their stories they're writing for school, in their essays, they can be proud of it. It's not something that they have to somehow get past to be successful here. They can incorporate it and make it part of why they are successful. So, I mean, that feels like the mission to me. Well, I think that mission is so important, especially when I even think of my own children, right? The fact that you use Poppy in, the, in your books, right? I see my kids always, you know, it's dad in, in the public school, right? They'll yeah. never say the word poppy. And the fact you're saying, no, it's okay. Like, you know, it's it's yeah. okay to utilize the words that at home, it's in front of you and it's okay to share that in with your friends and in your community. It doesn't have to stay in just in the family and be, almost be a secret that you call your dad poppy. Um, and so yeah. I, I, you know, I, I think that's um, really important and it is important for the, the celebration of Latin culture um, in, in the U.S. to really embrace and celebrate, which was also why I was excited about sharing the Latino experience PBS work that was happening because I think once again, there are so many amazing um, stories to be told that maybe haven't been heard as much as I wish they had been. Um, yeah. I, I've been watching that series, by the way. Oh, I've been really enjoying it. Yes, it's wonderful. I, I'm on the second, um, second episode series of films there there anybody listening tune in it's wonderful and i also want to say that i some of this issue of of identity and what we say at school and what we don't say at school comes up in mercy suarez can't dance as well in a moment between edna and um mercy i don't want to say more but the you know they're two latina girls right who are at odds at, at school mm -hmm. but there, there's overlap there. And so I'm, uh, I'll be very interested to see what readers have to say about that. Yeah, as, as will I. Um, in terms of, I know this year, the Library of Congress National Book Festival is occurring. Um, they have a theme, open a book, open the world, and it launches on September 17th and goes through the 26th. It um, markets in countries, it, it, there will be a 60 minute PBS special, um, and it'll start on September 12th at 6 p.m. Were you involved this year in the festival? And can you share a little bit about your involvement? Yes, I <laughs> am involved in the festival. The festival is a national treasure. That's all I can say about it. So it's a free book festival. It's usually, you know, in uh, at the convention center now in, in Washington, D.C. And I think everybody should go at least one time in their life. Just come to DC the weekend that they're giving it. And it's just, it's completely free. And it's just authors and illustrators of every type from adult people who are writing for adults all the way to children, people writing for children and everything in between, cookbooks, you name it, um, all kinds of stuff. And I am in conversation with the incredible, uh, Jerry Pinkney, who has a new book out, a new picture book um, on a retelling of The Little Mermaid, which is just breathtakingly beautiful. And I, we had such a beautiful conversation. I, I, of course, know of Jerry Pinkney's work, who, you know, he's just so decorated um, and have long been an admirer. So it was a dream to be in conversation with him. And we talked a lot about um, about writing for children, finding story, um, you know, our careers of in, in the space of writing, um, writing into uh, 
a space where we want to diversify and and feel feel in inclusive um, and invite all readers into our work. Uh, it was it was a really magical uh, conversation. I hope people tune in uh, for that one and for the many, many beautiful conversations that will be um, broadcast virtually uh, this year. It's really worth it. I know I certainly will tune in. Jory Pinckney was probably one of the first children's authors that I actually met uh, years and years ago. So he is such a talented um, writer and illustrator. Uh, his watercolors yes. are <laughs> yes. Well, you should see the watercolors on the ocean. Like so so of course the little mermaid is underwater and so the the his work on on cre recreating the ocean and his passion for saving the ocean and for how we treat the ocean. It was it, it's so layered. He's he's just marvelous. So anyway, tune in. Well, thank you cuz I didn't know that level. So thank you so much. Yeah. Um so I know that you probably have, I'd love to hear some of book recommendations, but before we get there, you also have a new, I think another new book coming out this year or soon, do you not? I do, I have, well, not. A, I have a book that came out in June on Sonia Sotomayor. Oh, it's is part of the She Persisted series, yes. Um, and so that is a based on Chelsea Clinton's picture book, She Persisted, and so, all of the women in the book then now have their own chapter book, and the all the books are written by um, exactly <laughs> are written by women authors working today. And so the collection we call ourselves a persisterhood. So <laughs> all the authors in the persisterhood were like giddy when we get to see each other. It's like oh my gosh, I can't believe I'm meeting you. It's so fun. It's unbelievably fun. I had. In fact, I did a talk with Rita Williams Garcia recently, and you know, it's it Sayantani Das Gupta. I mean, just wow. wonderful, wonderful, wonderful people. So um, that was really something I'd never written nonfiction before. Um, and it's about Sonia Sotomayor. So, you know, she's living, so you better make sure you get it right. And so I was, you know, how do you bring that kind of towering person? To, to readers who are seven and eight in a way that they can relate to it. And so um, it's been it's been really fun just to read the whole series uh, with that idea of how do we make history come alive for, for the very young. And especially for these really inspirational women that boys and girls everywhere need to, to know about. So there's that one. And then I have a story in an, in, an anthology uh, that comes out in um, October, and it's called uh, Wild Tongues Can't Be Tamed, and that comes out of Flatiron, and um, those are nonfiction uh, as well. Those are essays for teen readers, and um, yeah, so I'm, I'm in that one. That's exciting. Uh, I think the subtitle is 15 Voices from the Latino Diaspora, so oh, sorry. you might want to grab that, yeah, yeah. Sure. Um, did you get to meet uh, Sonia Sotomayor as you were writing I it? Did. Oh, you did! I did. Oh, I, did. <laughs> I know. I these are the experiences that you're like. Did this happen to me? So here's this. Here's the crazy part. The the really difficult part is that you're not allowed to photograph. You're not allowed to publish a photograph of your of any of the justices, right? So I can't take a photograph of myself. But right across this room, there is a photograph of me and, and the justice. Uh, we were at the Texas courthouse. I got to moderate a conversation with her um, about her picture book that was coming out, Just Ask, I think. And um, she was so charming. She was really delightful. Hard to pin down because she does not like to stay seated. She likes to get up. And so she got up and she walked all over the, the <laughs> Texas uh, State House and at all the really big, important desks were children, children and their families. And so that was just great fun. And before that, we had a chance to talk privately in the back. Um, and we talked about our families and our theas. And, you know, we're both New Yorkers. She's from the Bronx. I'm from Queens. So we had we <laughs> have plenty to talk about. And she was delightful and warm and just deserving of all the adulation our community heaps upon her. She was lovely. That's 
wonderful. And thank you for yeah. sharing that experience. Um, so we are getting to almost, we have to go to questions and answers. Um, okay. And But before we do, I want you to, if you can, if you have any advice for young people who maybe want to start writing or maybe not so young. I know there are some sometimes very untraditional paths um, to becoming a writer. So if you could share any insights you have for the, the wannabe writer, what should they yes. do? Yes. Okay, so first I'm gonna to say to you that I was one of those people who had a, a, an unorthodox introduction into writing. I tried to be everything else before I was a writer. I didn't start writing until I was 40. So, you know, it, it took a while to get the courage. But I would say, Two things. The first thing is read widely. So you want to read good examples of everything. I'm not the biggest fantasy fan, but when there is a great fantasy and I'm immersed in it, I'm delighted. So read, 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 because it gives you a sense of what's out there, first of all. It gives you uh, tools in the back of your brain. You're gathering tools, like ways that that authors have handled different things, um, how people handle voice and vocabulary and all kinds of things like that. Um, and then I would say that writing isn't something, I mean, you can get a degree, obviously, but writing is something that you get better at by doing it. You have to keep at it and keep practicing and keep, keep trying it and trying it and trying it. Writing is mostly rewriting. And so I think if you're a kid, for example, I think you should absolutely join the school paper or the magazine, write books in your classroom. If you're a fifth grader, write a picture book for a kindergarten kid, like keep, keep at it because that's where you start to get your voice, voice down. And I should say that on, on Instagram, I have a a new little series that I started called uh, One Minute Writing Tips. So if you follow me on Instagram, I think every Tuesday I'm putting one up. It's 60 seconds, literally, where I give you a writing tip on anything from plot to characters to anything like that. So, um, you know, use use people's expertise, your teachers, your friends who are writers, ask questions. That's what I would do. Uh, that's great advice. And I we definitely, I know I'll tune in. <laughs> some of the tips on yeah, how please. <laughs> it'll just be great to learn from you. Um, I feel like I've already learned so much. Um, we do have a question and the question is about um, you as a teacher. Um, they want to know how your lesson plans in the classroom influence how you write for an audience of young readers. So I haven't been a teacher for a long time, but I was a teacher for 10 years and I, it was a career that I adored. I love being with children um, of all ages. I taught from third grade all the way eventually to high school. Um, I think that my lesson plans when I, when I was teaching writing in particular had a lot of modeling in it. So I would take really good examples of writing happening now, you know, current authors, and I would bring it to the students and we'd read it and we'd, we'd try to create a, a piece that sort of modeled on that. Like, how did that author do that? Like, how can I try something similar? Um, I did a lot of things like when we, I, um, created the literary magazine, like we made the paper, we made it very tactile and hands-on. And I tried to give students a lot of agency around what they were writing. It took a lot of work, I think, as a teacher to create a climate where kids felt safe to write the truth. And, and, and for powerful writing, especially when we're talking about essays and things like that, you have to be willing to say the truth even when it's uncomfortable. So that in a secondary setting is hard, right? Because a lot of people are at cross purposes and because it, you know, you're not so sure about yourself at that time in your life. But it, I think it really falls on the teacher and the students to really work together to try to create a climate of trust and support. Um, it doesn't work 100% of the time, but I think that is that was the key. Um, we have one other question and it is about your discussion guide. So I, it says, I know that you have a discussion guide that you recently developed for reading um, and, and that there's inter, an intergenerational activity. Um, could you talk a little bit about that? 
I can't wait to talk about that. So this was actually developed for me um, by Cass Miner. She is a, an educator in the New York City Public Schools. And um, she looked at it in, in con collaboration with the Author Village. And so she looked at five of my books and she, it's an author study guide. So it's sort of studying these five books and figuring out activities that would promote literacy and, and connectedness among the family family members. So what are the activities that um, could go with this that have meaning in terms for the family and for the kids reading these books together, whether reading a picture book or a novel? The questions are are not just your typical discussion guide questions. You know how, how it is, you know, like I, I have a novel, I have 10 questions for you, you know, end of story. This isn't that. This is asking you to look at your own family, um, your own family tree, find stories of your family, you know, uh, take walks in the neighborhood, like all kinds of things that have to do with the themes and the um, and the underpinnings of of my work. Um, I think it also includes like a, a little uh, Q and A with with me, like background on me, on Cass. Um, it, it's fully hands on and it's free. You can come on my site and, and get it. It's a it's the author study guide. Um, and you could use it for any of the books. Um, five, I think, are are listed there. But Cass Minor was the author. She did a great job. Well, thank you. And I know teachers and librarians across the country will be utilizing it. So thank you for that. And thank you, Cass. Um, we are nearly at the top of the hour and we need to close the program. Um, but I just want to thank you, Meg, so much for your vision, your message, your your dedication to sharing the your perspective on the Latino story. Um, and you know, it's just been such an amazing hour, and we can't wait to see where else Mercy goes. Um, oh. So thank you, thank you so much. Actually, when Mer Mercy Suarez becomes, is it plays plays it cool? Plays uh, it cool. That'll be the last one next year. So maybe we can see you again next year, if not before. Um, so thank you so much, um, and we hope we hope to to see you again. Uh, we want to thank the viewers for joining us. And so from PBS Books, thank you. Until next not until next time, we'll see you soon. Thank you. Bye.